we've been asked to pray for a very special person uh, to Aaron Needham. Aaron's stepdad is in the hospital, and uh, as they were sharing with me, and I hope I'm not sharing information that I shouldn't, but uh, he's got stage four cancer and an infection in the blood. And so we've been asked to pray, and his name is Joe. So would you stretch out your hands and let's go to the Lord in prayer, believing that, that Jesus hears our prayers and that he will answer. Lord, we come on behalf of Joe right now who's in the hospital. God, I pray over him. I pray that, Father, first of all, that you would draw him closer to you. Father, if he's not one of your children, I pray that somehow, some way, somebody will speak to him the truth of the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray over his physical healing, Lord. I pray that, Father, that uh, you would remove this cancer from his body, that you would clear up his blood, that, Lord, you'd give doctors wisdom how to, to do that. But, Lord, we know that you are the great physician. We know that you hold all power within your hands, and all that you have to do is speak the word. And so, Father, if it be your will, we pray that you would speak over him and into him your grace and that cleansing would come to his soul but also to his body and remove this cancer from him and this blood that, he's, that has become infected. So, Father, I pray for him. I pray for a total healing, and we want to thank you. Thank you for these that are here this morning and all of God's people said, Amen. We have been looking the last couple of weeks at this theme called fear. Now, maybe you're so strong that you've never had any fear come up into your life. I can tell you that this is something that has plagued just about every one of us at some point. If you haven't been plagued by fear, you will be plagued by fear before you leave from this world. And so I, I want to share with you that the Bible teaches us that when we are afraid, it's not that God has made us afraid. The Bible says that uh, we have not been given the spirit of fear but of love and power and of a sound mind. And so those are important ingredients as we think about what God wants to do in us and through us to give us the ability to live our lives in freedom. And so the one that I want us to focus in on today, I will almost promise you there's somebody in here that this is going to rest squarely on their shoulders. And I can tell you from my own personal experience I wrestle with it all the time. What am I talking about? When, when, uh, when you begin to think about what we're going to talk about, there's been many definitions given to this. Some people call it tension. How many of you have ever had a tension headache? Or tension has built up in your, in your shoulders, in your back that you have a headache, you know, from all of this tension that comes into your life. Anybody out here ever have those moments? I know I do. Others have simply called it anxiety. I'm anxious. I'm anxious. The Bible simply called it huh, worry. Now, how many... This is not, I don't know that you can find this word in a dictionary. How many of you are worry warts? I mean, you just worry. Oh, we have some that are obviously in tune with what's going on. The rest of you are so pious, you would never admit that you are a worrier. But let me, let me I, I looked up the word worry, and it comes from a, from an Anglo, an old Anglo-Saxon word, which means to strangle or to choke. Isn't it funny how the devil introduces things in our lives that literally strangle us from the fear of worry or the fear of something that's coming along or it chokes us and we can't catch our breaths. The Bible teaches us that Jesus took this head on, and I invite you to take your Bibles and turn with me to Matthew chapter 6 and verse 34. I want you to see it for yourself. I pray and hope that you brought your copy of the Word of God along with you so that you can mark it in your Bible or at least on your electronic device. You can go back and highlight it and hopefully 
draw out some things from this as we think about this, this fear that comes into our lives in the shape of worry, anxiety, tension. Jesus took it head on when he said this, Therefore, now anytime you see a therefore in the Bible, you need to find out what it's there for. Hello? And so Jesus has laid out some things that he's drawing our attention to, and after he gets through teaching this, he comes to this conclusion, therefore. And so when you read it, you understand Jesus has just taught us a discourse, and now he's saying, therefore. Look back at what I've just said. Therefore, what does he say? Mark it in your Bible, do not worry. Say it out loud with me, do not worry. Now, how many times does the Lord Jesus Christ have to tell us, do not worry, and we ignore it? We simply just ignore the admonition of God, and he tells us over and over again, do not worry. Now, what does he say? Do not worry about what? Mark this in your Bible about tomorrow. Do you understand that most of our fears with the anxiety or tension or worry is about the future? What is tomorrow going to bring? Do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Don't worry about tomorrow. Don't worry about tomorrow. How many of you have something coming up tomorrow, this coming week, this, this by the end of the year, you've got to make decisions, you've got to come to a conclusion, you've got to go here, go there. You are concerned, we hide it pretty good, we are concerned about events that are going to happen tomorrow. And so as Jesus teaches us this, I pray and hope that it begins, it begins to speak to you and to give you a little bit of hope. So let me, let me make a clarification. There is a difference between worry and concern. Hello? Now, let me, let me for example, we worry about our finances. We worry about what others think of us. We worry about what the future holds. Now, let me stop parenthetically and say this. We have been asked, as the body of Christ, we have been asked as the believing brothers and sisters that we need to pray specifically over this election that's coming up, more importantly, over the nomination of the, the new Supreme Court nominee. Because the ungodly world does not want a conservative a believing person of faith to hold that position. Now, what is stake? It could possibly be that we save unborn lives. And so we need to pray. Now, you may say, well, that's you, preacher, that's your belief. It is my belief. But I believe this because not that I'm an upright standing citizen. I believe this because we believe in a God, and we believe that God is going to hold us accountable. And I believe that God has brought us to a point in our history where pivotal things could take place. So rather than worry, what do we need to do? We need to pray. So as a church, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Let's ask that God would wrap his wings around this nominee this person of faith, this mother who is a constitutionalist, but also somebody who believes in the importance of life, the dignity of life. And so I want us to pray, as we have been asked to do as the body of Christ, I want us to pray. Those of you watching online and at home, pray with me. Don't send me a nasty telegram. You just pray, and if not, you don't believe that, then cut me off right now, because we're going to pray. So let's pray, body, the body of Christ. Father, in the name of Jesus, we've been asked that we would wrap this nominee up in our prayers and that, Father, you would protect this nominee. I pray that you will uh, lead our, our Senate to confirm this in rapid, in rapid days. And so, Father, I pray over the election that's coming up. I pray that your will would be done. 
But Father, I pray that we take the Supreme Court and that, Lord, we will protect the lives of unborn children. And we pray this in Jesus' name. And all of God's family said, Amen. So we worry about the future. We worry about what's going to happen. We understand and we believe that God is leading. God is doing things. So there's a clarification. There's a difference between worry and concern. Now listen to me. If you have children playing in a busy street and you're not concerned about them playing in a busy street, you're a bad parent. Hello? If, if, for, um, if you're not concerned about saving money for the future, your future retirement, if God gives you grace, let me tell you what is going to happen. You are going to get older. And you are going to get to a place at some point you will not be able to work anymore. So you had better, young people, if I could tell you anything, start saving today. Because these days will come very quickly. And you won't think, well, God's going to take care of me. Yeah, he may take care of you. You may starve, but you, he's going to take care of you. So start planning to now. There is legitimate reasons why you need to be concerned. But there are things every day that we need to, to legitimately be concerned about. There's a difference between being carefree and careless. Now, I'm not talking about legitimate concerns. I'm talking about illegitimate worries. And so somewhere in our thinking, we've often attached worry to the future. Some of you are sitting here worried about tomorrow. Maybe, maybe you're young, you've got a test at school tomorrow, a test at university. Whatever is coming up, you're worried about tomorrow. Let me, let me help you. If you'll study today, there's no reason to be worried about tomorrow. But as long as there are tests given in school, there will always be prayer. may not do you no good if you haven't studied, but there will always be prayer in school. So we understand there's a difference between being carefree and careless. And so Jesus taught us, therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. We are going to face things in every single day, so we can only take it one day at a time. So let me share with you how, how the Word of God exhorts us and encourages us to overcome this worry of the future. Let me share with you some things that I believe you can write down that you can take home, that you can apply to your life today that will help you about tomorrow. First of all, let me just share this with you. Somebody has defined worry as the interest we pay in advance today for trouble that may never come tomorrow. How many of you have ever worried about something that was going to happen tomorrow and it never happened? That that's happens in all of our lives. You see, the problem with worrying and fearing the future is simply this. When you are worrying, you are acting like a spiritual orphan. Now, there's the reasons for that. What you're really saying is this. I don't really believe God can do what he says he will do, and I don't really believe that God will be with me and take care of me in any trouble. So when I was studying for this, one of pastors, one of the pastors that I greatly admire and respect had this to say. God made you so that you would not be able to see into the future no matter how much you try. I, I think that there's a reason why you and I can't see into the future because none of us would want to go there if he revealed it to us. Even with all the gimmicks to predict the future, you, you don't really know what's going to happen. But why did God do this? He did it so you would depend on him. So every single day, you've got to, I encourage you, wake up and ask God, God, help me with this day. God, show me this day. Block out all the other days, but help me today with this day. Now, being the worrier that I am myself, let me give you three encouragements that I believe you can go home with that will help you if we will live them out. First of all, remember how God has performed in the past. Remember how God has performed 
in the past. How many of you would say, Preacher, I, I know God has taken care of me in the past. I know God protected me in the past. Now let me share with you a story that happened. This is not a, this is not a made-up preacher story. This literally happened. My wife and I were leaving Florida, going to uh, Louisville, Kentucky. That's where I had received a scholarship to Southern Seminary. I had received a presidential scholarship. I was going to finish or continue my education there in Louisville. Well, we'd made it to Atlanta. We spent the night with her grandmother. We got up the next morning. I'm driving a U-Haul truck, and she is following me in her little Subaru car. We leave the next morning. We go on the belt loop. We went around 295 and come back into 75. Well, unbeknowing to me, I'm just thinking, I'm certain that she's right behind me. I mean, who can't keep up with a U-Haul truck? It won't go but so fast. Somehow, she and I got separated, and I'm a trucking on. I'm looking behind me. I pull off the side of the road. She doesn't come. I'm thinking, oh, my. Well, she knows the way to Kentucky. <laughs> so I, uh, I, got, I get far enough down the road, and I think, well, maybe, maybe not. And so I turn back around. In the meantime... Susan has gotten off the road. She's called her daddy down here in Leesburg, Florida. She calls him. I don't know what she thought he was going to do with her up in Atlanta, but she calls him, and so I come all the way back into Atlanta. I don't see her car. I turn back around and headed back towards Louisville, and as God would have it, this is not a story, I look up, and she is sitting on the overpass. <laughs> God is my witness. She's right, she's right there. So I pull past, I pull off the side of the road, she gets on the entrance ramp, she comes up behind me, and on the edge of I-75, we have a fight. <laughs> I mean, we're carrying on right beside I-75. What we did not know, and this is true, had we continued to go in the direction we were going in Chattanooga, Tennessee, I think that's right, there had been a mudslide in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and had we continued on the course at the rate we were going, we would have been in the middle of a mudslide. God protected us. Little did we know. We're arguing and fighting on the side of I-75, a preacher and his wife going up the road. This, I mean, God protected us. Has that ever happened to you where you know God protected you or that God provided for you. You know that God did it his, himself. There was no other reason that God was just watching out for you. Now this becomes a marker for you to understand what God did in the past, God is still able to do in the future. You serve a God that is not only was not only back there, you serve a God that's, that's right here today. And if you wake up tomorrow, you serve a God that will be in tomorrow when you wake up this is our God. He was the God yesterday. He is God today, and he will still be God tomorrow. Look at the past, how God has taken care of you, how God has protected you. This is a God that you can trust in. This is the God that we call out to. This is the God who provides for us. But here's one thing that I want you to, to think about. I believe that it will help you face the future. Are you ready? Here's one thing. You can only live one day at a time. How many of you remember the old song, One Day at a Time, Lord Jesus? One day at a time. That's all we've got. Now listen, yesterday is a canceled check, and as much as you want to realize it, I wish I'd have, I'd have thought about this. I thought, how many of you have ever seen the old chicken walking around that uh, has made it through the week, most of her feathers is, is off of her, and she's walking around strutting? I may not look pretty, but I'm, I'm here today. You know, this is, this is, I don't know what's going to happen today, but here's what I do know. God took care of me yesterday. And the God who took care of me yesterday is able to take care of me today. This is my God. And this is my God that tomorrow he will take care of me tomorrow. So yesterday's a canceled check. Today is all that you have right now. But you're still standing. 
one of the greatest leaders that has that's ever graced the pages of history was this man called Moses. How many of you remember reading of Moses in the Old Testament? Now, we know that Moses, from the story, if you've ever watched uh, the Ten Commandments that generally come on at Easter time, I, I, love, I love that, and generally watch it just about every Easter. Cecil B. DeMille's, you know, put it on cinemagraph, and so we watch this. Moses, who was raised as a prince in Egypt, would have taken over the throne, but decided... He would live with his people. They were in bondage. And so God told Moses, remember that Moses even committed murder so that one of his fellow Hebrews would live. And so Moses, who fled to the backside of Sinai, one day God appeared to him in a burning bush and told Moses, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go back down to Egypt. You say what? I want you to go back down to Egypt and set my people free. Now think about this. Here's the man that was herding sheep, but God all of a sudden told him to go back and deliver his people. We know that God did it through miraculous signs, and every time God would perform a miracle. Miracle after miracle after miracle. But then when he got them out of Egypt, he had over a million people that looked to him for leadership every single day. In fact, God so performed for them that every single day, every single morning, God would provide them manna. And it, it just rained down out of the sky. God gave them manna every morning. But the, the children of Israel griped and complained. How many of you have ever griped and complained that all you have in the house is peanut butter and cookies? Anybody ever been there? Yeah. Or that you don't, you know, your mama don't cook your favorite food every single day. Or maybe all you got to eat is beans in the house. Beans in the morning, beans in the evening, beans at supper time. I mean, this is, this is all we have. God gave them miraculous food every single day, but they griped and complained. Does that bear any resemblance to you and I? Or, what about this? God said, all right, I will give you meat to eat. And every evening, God gave them quail to eat. They didn't even have to go hunt it. God had them fly into the camp. All they had to do was pick them up and cook them. God gave them bread. God gave them meat. And listen, when they were going around in the wilderness, they would cry out to, to Moses, we don't have anything to drink. You know what God would do through Moses? God told Moses, speak to the rock, and water would come out of the rock. Have you ever done that? No, I haven't either. But God did it through Moses, and here's, here's the interesting thing. God took care of them. Moses was leading them. I would have pulled my hair out, but God used Moses in this, in this way. And so in all of this, I want you to read this for yourself. Turn with me over to the book of Deuteronomy to chapter 1, Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 30 and 31. I want you to see it for yourself. I want you to mark it in your Bible. Here's what the Bible says. Are you there? Deuteronomy chapter 1, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. What comes next? Deuteronomy. So go to Genesis, hang a right, you'll come to it. Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 30, here's what the Bible says. The Lord your God who goes before you, he will fight for you according to all that he did for you in Egypt before your eyes. And in the wilderness where, he, where you saw how the Lord your God carried you, as a man carries his son in all the way that you went until you came to this place. What was God telling Moses? God told Moses, sit the people down and carry them down memory lane and let them remember what God did for them. Sometimes as we are stressing out in our present day lives, it helps us to go back and remember the God who met my need yesterday is the same God that can meet my need today. There's no reason to fear when God, we understand that the God who did it then is still able to do it now. And so what what God was telling them, do you remember the Red Sea? 
Did God part the Red Sea? Yes. I've had professors that have argued that the Red Sea was not literally that deep. It was the Reed Sea, and the water wasn't nothing but ankle deep. Let me tell you what I said to them. That was a bigger miracle than if God buried them all in the Red Sea because he drowned an army in a water that wasn't nothing but knee deep. Hello? Our God did that. He opened the sea, and the Bible says they went through on dry land. Let me tell you what happened to me last year. I was fishing out in the Gulf, and I, I mean, we were, we, we were up close, and I was throwing this hard lure, and it got hung up on an oyster box. So I'm thinking, I have lost so many of these things. I, I'm not going to lose this lure. And so I slid out the back of the boat and thought I would walk we weren't but about, you know, 25, 30 feet from where it was hung up. So I thought I would walk from where the back of the boat was over and pick up my lure. Bad idea. As I stepped out of the boat and tried to walk, my feet went down in mud. I couldn't get my feet out of the mud. Stunk, oh my goodness. Now here's my, here's my point of what I'm telling you. I ruined a $70 pair of shoes trying to get a $10 lure. <laughs> and all the while, the two in the boat are laughing at me. <laughs> my ankles were cut from the oysters, my feet. I said, you got to come get me. I can't move. I couldn't pick my feet up. God told Moses, remember what I did on the Red Sea. Remember how I opened the water and you went across on dry land. You remind the people of this. You remind the people of how uh, when they didn't have nothing to eat, remember that I gave them a, a pillar of fire by day and a, and a cloud by, I mean, a, a pillar of fire by night and a cloud by day. You, you have them remember this. You have them remember how I destroyed the Egyptian army. You remember what I did. And in all of our lives, you remember what God did yesterday. He has taken care of you. So the whole point that Moses was making in this is that do you see how God performed in the past? The God who performed in the past is the God who's going to take care of you today. Look with me. Hang a right and go over to the book of Isaiah. And I want you to see this for yourself. Isaiah 46, 3. In Isaiah 46, 3, here's what the Bible says. Listen to me, O house of Jacob, and all the remnant of the house of Israel, who have been upheld by me from birth, who have been carried from your womb. Do you know what Isaiah was telling them? From the moment you were conceived in your mother's womb, at the exact same moment that there was a, a baby that became a, a living organism in its mother's womb, I have carried you. You know what that says? Before you ever knew there was a God, before a thought ever went through your brain, God was saying this, I have carried you. I have taken care of you. But look with me at not only... Isaiah 46, 3. Look at verse 4. Even to your old age, I am he. Even to gray hairs, I will carry you. I have made and I will bear. Even I will carry and will deliver you. Do you see what he's saying? From the moment you were conceived until the moment that you die, if you get to die of old age, when your hair turns gray, before there were ever any hair until your hair turns gray or it turns loose, God is there taking care of you. And he's there providing for you. So remember what God has done in the past. Go back and, and walk down memory lane and get it fixed in your mind. You see, your life is like two bookends. From the moment you were born to the moment you die, God is there taking care of you. God was there. God is there. God will always be there. This is our God that we love. This is the God. You and I have an advantage over people who do not know God. 
We have a God that we can go back and remember how he has provided for you. And if you will remember what God has performed in the past, he's the same God that will perform it today and tomorrow. If I could guarantee you this, you would never, ever, ever, if God would take care of everything in your life and you'd never, ever have another worry, would you trust that God? I mean, if I promised you, don't worry about anything, I'm going to take care of it. How would that sound to you? It'd be a pretty good deal, wouldn't it? Well, let me share with you, that's not just hopeful thinking. That is the Word of God. In fact, take your Bibles and turn to the book of Romans chapter 8. You know the Scripture by heart, but here's what the Bible teaches us in Romans chapter 8. Romans 8, 28, he tells us this. We know that all things work together for good. Do we know that? We know that all things work together for good to those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. So remember this. Remember how God's taken care of you in the past. Remember, number two, realize what God has promised in the present. Now go back over to the book of Matthew, and I want you to see this. In Matthew chapter 6, verse starting in verse 25, I want you to mark it in your Bibles. He tells us three times. He says this in, in Matthew 6, 25, do not worry. Do you see it? Look with me in verse number 31. He tells you, do not worry. He tells you again down here in verse 34, do not worry. How many times does somebody have to tell you something? Did any of you ever get a spanking because you didn't listen to mom and dad? <laughs> Mine always told me this hurts me worse than it did you. I knew he was lying because he was about to beat me to death. <laughs> but after I had children myself, <laughs> still didn't make any difference. <laughs> God told us, don't worry. Realize this, that God is working right now, today, right here in the present. Realize what God has promised right here in the present. But he tells us why we don't need to worry. He tells us, sufficient for the day is its own trouble. You're going to have enough trouble today, so don't worry. Don't worry. Each day has enough trouble. But then there's a third thing. I want you to rely on what God has planned for the future. Rely on what God has in store for you, has planned for you in the future. In verse 34, do not worry about tomorrow. Listen to this verse out of the, out of the message Bible. Here's what it says. Give your attention to what God is doing right now. Don't get worked up about what may or may not happen tomorrow. God will help you deal with whatever hard things come up when time, when the time comes. So again, everything that's in your life, God says, don't worry about it. For we know that all things work together for good. Yesterday is gone. You can't do nothing about it. Today is the only day you have. Tomorrow you can't touch yet. So here's two things I want to give you. One is this. Every time you worry, it's optional. God said don't do it, but you do it anyway. Worry is optional. Nobody forces it on us. So every time we worry, we choose to worry. Every time fear comes into our life, we choose to act on fear when the Bible says God didn't give it to us. So the thing that I want you to, to take away is this. When you know this book and you know this God, you really have nothing to worry about. God's going to take care of you. God's going to provide for you. But then there's one last thing that I draw your attention to. Leave tomorrow alone. Leave it alone. Why? 
You can't touch it yet. How many of you realize that on your, if you have a calendar at home, every day is numbered? Did you realize that? Why, why on calendars do they number the days? Because today is all you have. Leave tomorrow alone. Leave it in its square. You can't do anything about it today. You can only live today. Live today. We're so consumed about tomorrow and what may happen or what may not happen that we can't live today. Now, don't get the idea that you have nothing to worry about. I do want to share with you two things that you had better be worried about. You'd better be worried about death. And you better be worried about judgment. Did you hear me? Do you know how many people in this room is going to die? Every single one of them. God may bless you with long, long days. I spoke with a woman yesterday that she'd just come from a funeral of a woman that was 105 years old. That's a long life. Can you imagine what that woman saw in 105 years? So you better be worried about death. And you better be worried about judgment. Because the Bible says this, it's appointed unto man once to die and then the judgment. And some people are brought up with the idea there's going to be a party in hell. That's not going to be it at all. You're going to be separated. There's going to be burning and the gnashing of teeth in hell. Don't be separated from God. But that's the beauty of the Bible. That's the beauty of Jesus. Jesus died on the cross so that you wouldn't have to fear death and you wouldn't have to worry about where you're going to spend eternity. He provides all of it for us. All you have to do is accept Him. And so this morning I want you to, if you've never done that, I, I pray, I ask that God give you the grace that you would receive this gift that God gives it to us free. Reach out and take it. If you're listening at home, I, I pray, I pray that you'd receive this gift right there in your home. Bow your heads with me, would you please, as we go to the Lord in prayer. Could I ask you that those of you who are in this room, please don't, please don't get up and walk around. If you're at home, please don't turn it off yet. Because I believe the whole purpose of the message is to bring you to this point that you could receive this gift of God free. Pray this prayer with me. If you've never received this gift that God offers to us, each one of us, do it right now. Pray this prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, I confess I need you. I want you to be my Savior. Come into my life. Forgive me of my sins. Make me a home in heaven. If you're praying that prayer, if you've prayed it at home, may I encourage you, before you click off, may I say congratulations to you, but go, go on, on your text and send this message, SAVED, to 474747. For those of you who are in this room, I don't know where you are, I don't know if you've ever received Jesus, but today God has brought you to this place at this time to receive his gift of eternal life. If you prayed that prayer today, would you simply raise your hand? I will not embarrass you. Anybody in here, if you'd raise your hand, if you prayed that prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for these that are here. Thank you for these who have had courage to come. Father, remove this fear of the future from us. God, we have nothing to fear because you are always with us. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for taking care of us in Jesus' name. We're going to stand. We're going to sing. If you'd like for me to pray with you, I'll be down front. I'll be glad to pray with you. If you have a need, whatever that may be, we'll pray about it with you. Wow. 
Thank you, Pastor, for that powerful message. Nothing could make us happier than to know that you have prayed to receive Christ this morning. We want to be able to celebrate that awesome decision with you. So if you will just simply text the word FIND to 474747, we are waiting to hear from you. We would like to encourage you in your next steps. We also would like to thank everyone who has faithfully given to this ministry. We're able to reach so many outside of the walls of our church and to offer the message of Jesus further than we've ever been able to do before. If you're able to give just a portion of what you've been blessed with, um, you can give two ways. You can mail your gift or you can give online. We believe that prayer can move mountains. So if we can pray for you about anything, please share with us by emailing us at prayer at pgbcfl.net. I'm excited to see you right here again next week. And remember, God is crazy about you.